Okay, first of all, you might think, what are these things? What do they have to do with each other? Rope, t-shirts, mountaineering, gender. And so what I'm gonna be doing in my talk is I'm gonna be talking to you about how not only do they go together, but they can help us rethink how we understand the operations of gender, how they operate right now in our lives now. First of all, just want to start with a start. What is gender? <laughs> okay, I understand gender to be the social expression of your biological identification at times as a man, as a woman, or as someone else entirely. There's more than two genders. Now, as you can see up here, Traditionally, we've understood gender to be identified with biology. If you're biologically female, you must act as a woman. And if you're biologically male, you must act as a man. But as everyone knows, gender, in fact, is learned. We learn how to do it. You are not born knowing how to be the gender that you now identify as. When you're even a baby, before you can even talk, somebody probably came to you and said, what if you were a man you know, or a boy, what a strong boy. And so if you were a girl, of course you might hear, what a pretty girl. Even before you can talk, you're going to, you know, you have an idea about what you're supposed to do. So we all learn how to do this. We learn by making mistakes. We learn by being recognized as a gender or misrecognized. And we're always having to practice it over and over. Every woman who has ever looked at a beauty magazine knows how expensive and complex it is to be your gender. If it, right? If it were natural, you'd just know. But because it isn't, you need Chatelaine to help you out. Right? Or Vogue or whatever. Guys, you know, you don't have it any easier. You constantly have to be told and taught how to act as a man. And if you don't act quite as a man should, boy, do you ever find out. Okay, so that's one thing I wanted to get across here. What is gender and how do we, and you know, and that it's a learned process. But another thing that's connected to gender is how do we really understand it right now? Feminism, which is the ideology, the discourse, and the practice of thinking through ideas that are connected to gender equality and gender and justice, is right now, I think, in generally in mainstream culture, it's being understood as, you know, the F word. You know, you can't say it. Some of my students will say things like, I'm not a feminist, but I believe in, and then they list all the feminist things off. <laughs> Guys, too. I'm a feminist, I'm not a feminist. But I believe all these things. So it's like we, so it's almost like the ideals are not in discussion, and it's given rise to the thought that maybe we're in a post-feminist era, maybe we're not talking about these issues anymore. And I'm here to tell you, nuh-uh. <laughs> gender is everywhere. But when, instead of talking about gender, and here I'll give you an example right from mountaineering, instead of talking about gender in the abstract, we use objects, things, to talk about what we cannot name, what we do not discuss. Here's a famous painting by Caspar Friedrich from the early Romantic period. It's called Wander Above the Sea of Fog, and many of you may have seen it before. A couple of important things about this picture. Notice, for example, that we're standing behind him. He's not looking at us. So what that means is that we don't know what his experience is. It's meant to be private, spiritual, but we're supposed to see what he's seeing. The implication is that we stand in his shoes is that we could be him, right? And we could have this mountaintop experience. Also, that he's above everything. He's above the clouds, but he's also above all the nasty, petty, everyday concerns. And he seems to be above things like gender, economic status, race. That's what mountaineering has historically been associated with, the idea of getting above the bad things about society, having a mountaintop experience, right? That's never about having a nasty experience. It's always about getting above something. Okay, so you might say, all right, these are high ideals, and they look universal, they look great, but what cannot be mentioned occupies the very center of this painting, this man's body. You can tell that he's white, you can tell that he's relatively well off because he's wearing nice 19th century clothes, right? He's got a cane. You don't see a servant, the person that would have helped him get up there, do you? No one's helping him. This is the ideal of romanticism that you just ascend all by yourself as if you're on a cloud. And of 
course, he's a man, he's a guy. It's not mentioned, but it's in the center of the representation. And in mountaineering discourse more generally, that is the way that gender gets talked about. In fact, what happens is that gender gets connected to objects, right? And so instead of talking about the issue in the abstract, people attach their ideas, their feelings to objects. So in a second, I think we're going to see our first object, which is rope. Okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about it. There it is. There's some climbing ropes. They've been artistically manipulated, so they look like mountains, you know. In a 1950s climbing guide, in, it was a British guide by a man named Showell Stiles, um, and it's called the Mountaineer's Weekend Book. He has a section on rope. In mountaineering, rope is a safety device. Okay, so you, you're tied to it, and then you're tied to either the rock or you're tied to another person. And that way, if you fall, somebody's going to help you or the rock's going to stop you. Okay, so simple safety device. But Showell Style says it's a lot more than that. Rope becomes, for him, he calls it the badge of the climber. In other words, when you see a climber with a rope, like coiled up or whatever, over their shoulders, they're not just a hiker. They're not just a camper. There's somebody special. So the rope is the way you can tell that climbers belong to a special community, okay? It's like their uniform, okay? And so here it is, an everyday, you know, object, just a safety object, right, in that sense. But it's actually more than that. It is, you know, the, it is the sign of climbing. Here is a picture of Gaston Rebuffat. He was a famous mountaineer from France who pioneered uh, rock climbing in the Alps. And uh, this is him in 1955 in his artistic sweater. And basically what he's doing there, <laughs> always wore that fantastic sweater. He makes it look easy. Okay. In his book, Starlight and Storm, he has a chapter called The Brotherhood of the Rope. And it's supposed to be a how-to guide that tells you how to use ropes, okay? It has diagrams and stuff. But you know what else it has? It has this special passage and it says, it talks about how the first time when you, he says, you went climbing, and he means a young man. That's who he's thinking about because it's 1950 whatever. So you went, and he says that the rope is more than a safety device. It is the connection between you and another man. It is the means of what he calls the brotherhood of the rope. That's really important, because in K when, when K2 was being tried in the 1950s, Charlie Houston had originated this phrase, the brotherhood of the rope. And really what it signifies is this spiritual connection between men, okay? Um, the Houston expedition was really important for this. It is often held up as the most harmonious mountaineering expedition of all time. No one has ever worked together as well as this expedition and ever will again. Here's a couple of pictures of them all cheerfully going up the <laughs> mountain. Of K2 is the second highest mountain in the world. It is in the Karakoram re range of Pakistan, and it is one of the most difficult to climb of all. So, and there's Charlie Houston on the right, you know, negotiating his way. So that's one thing that brotherhood meant. It was this high ideal, but it was only for certain kinds of men, supermen, not for the porters who helped them, not for Sherpas, okay, who helped them, and not for women. So the brotherhood is seeming all, you know, this, you know, all good and nice, but there's some problems with it. It also acquired another dimension on the climb. As you can see in the picture on the left, um, there was a mountaineering accident that happened to this group while they were high on K2. Art Gilkey, who was one of the expedition members, got blood clots in his legs, and he was unable to go on. As one man, the accounts say, the group decided to turn around, give up its you know, quest for the summit and try to rescue him. And they were very high in the mountain. It was, it was really almost impossible. While they were lowering him over a difficult, you know, a little difficult rock face here, and it was very steep, one of the rope teams fell and got tangled with the other rope teams and everybody ended up hanging off one rope, by, which was held by Pete Schoening. It is the most famous mountaineering accident in the history of mountaineering. And all of the men who were on that rope were saved, except for Art Gilkey, who became detached after they had done the rescue and who fell to his death. On the right, you can see uh, the Gilkey Memorial, which was built by the team and the porters. That was the other occasion for brotherhood, because death had come 
and the group had to make group solutions for things, they found a deeper brotherhood. When they were all talking afterwards, that's what they were talking about. But as you can see in these pictures here, the brotherhood excluded women in particular. On the left, you see Miriam Underhill. She was an early rock climber, and she was an early alpinist. In an essay that she wrote in the 1930s called Manless Climbs, <laughs> you too, she said, can climb manless. <laughs> 1930. Okay, so there she is, and she says she wanted to have something called La Corde de la Feminine, the women's rope, because men would let her climb on ropes. They said that she wasn't, because she was female, she mustn't be able to climb, and if you can't climb, you can't lead. So she was like, all right. She made her own ropes, she made, and she had women climbing by themselves, but this idea did not catch on. On the right is Rhonda Rukovitz, who was the greatest high, um, high alpine uh, female mountaineer in the world, and one of the best anyway. And this is her in the 60s, um, and that's just come by. You're going to see this coming up. She also was frustrated, so she started a woman's only climbing group. And what they were going to do, and that was what became the 1978 American Women's Expedition. And here I am at my second thing, the t-shirt. This is their design that they used to raise money, okay? A woman's place is on top. Of course, it has more than one meaning, doesn't it, audience? <laughs> Here's the group of them. The t-shirt was the occasion for several things. It was part of feminist activist practice. No one would support this group. They didn't have very much corporate sponsorship. I think Band-Aids gave them $100. So they just had nothing. So they decided to raise their own money with t-shirt sales, right? Like a good activist should. But at the, you know, at the same time, you know, there's all this playfulness. The group wasn't as cohesive as you would have thought. There were a couple of members who did not want male Sherpas to be along giving support on the expedition, and they fought. And that was like competing ideas about gender that were being worked out. Should women do things just on their own without men for once? Does it matter or not? And the women who were arguing that there should be just women on the climb never wore these t-shirts. So the object became a way to signify, to, under to help you understand, you know, it became a way to talk about something that is rarely mentioned. On the left, you do see some of the original expedition members wearing t-shirts, they're in a meeting. And on the right, the way that the t-shirts look today. You actually can go on the expedition leader Arlene Blum's website, and you actually can order them if you want to be wearing a woman's places on top. You know, Christmas is coming. <laughs> Get going. So it all looks harmonious, doesn't it? But as I say, there were, there were competing ideas about what women were and what women should do on this expedition, and sometimes they centered on these kinds, on these kinds of differences around what the t-shirt actually meant, okay? There's another example, too, that's just going to be coming up now. It was the belief of the, of the members of the American expedition, because it was the 1970s, that women have, were experienced sisterhood with other women around the world. So what these women thought was that if they helped Sherpa women who were along on the expedition as cooks and helpers, if they helped them to become climbers and then helped them to become mountain guides, these women could be freed from oppression. It sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> One of the problems of the feminist movement at this period was they kind of didn't understand cultural difference, that gender means different things <laughs> to different people all over the world. So they gave these women t-shirts. There they are, there's some Sherpani women, they're wearing their t-shirts, and, and they look pretty happy about it, right? Especially the one on the left, she's really into it, you know? <laughs> they're rocking their shirts. But it didn't work out. These two women and the other women who were on the expedition, who were Sherpa women, all quit. None of them actually went and even got onto the glacier. They all left before that. And some of them were interviewed later, and what they said was they just felt like the American women in particular did not understand what their issues were. And unfortunately, the expedition members did not communicate very well at all So, with these women to find out what their issues were and what their dreams were. So it was one of these cases where there was really, a, it was a failed opportunity in that sense for that kind of communication. And the t-shirt symbolizes it. It makes it look like there's cohesion, but they, they each group understood different things about the object, okay? Just because you're dealing with the same object doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree about the object or even about the concept behind it. Finally, and it is kind of a sad picture, this is Arlene Bloom, the expedition leader, 
And what she is doing is calling two team members on the radio while she's wearing her Annapurna Women's Place t-shirt. Two of the women on the expedition, as I had mentioned, Allison Chadwick and Eastwitz, and uh, Vera Watson, that's, there were two Veras and this is the other one, um, they actually were among the people who believed that the Sherpas should not help these women summit the mountain. Uh, just on a couple of days previous, a team from this whole expedition did successfully summit. It had two of the expedition members and two Sherpa men on it. And these two women said, no, we're going to climb another line, we're going to climb another peak on the mountain, and we're going to do it just as women, and no one's ever done it before. And so, and they had a fight with Arlene Bloom about that because her idea of feminism was we have to work together and men can be there too. And their idea was no, it is not an achievement. Unfortunately, while they were on their way to their first camp, it would have not mattered if anyone had been with them, they fell to their deaths uh, and they were subsequently found high on the mountain, but their bodies were not recoverable. So this is the moment that you see where Arlene is worried as a leader, is worried about her team. So here we see where the, what the t-shirt means is once again, it means solidarity. Even though there are differences inside of this group, you could really say that, um, you know, even though there were differences, that the women did have some cohesion and solidarity around these events, in particular the deaths of these two women, which were lamentable. Okay, so, what are, so what's my conclusion here? It is that objects mean more than you think they do. They speak louder than words. When we ask ourselves, what is a woman? What is a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man now? We don't have to answer in the abstract. We can look to objects, how we use them, how we think about them every day, and they can show us what we are thinking about gender right now. Thank you very much.